Step 4. Stationary and flying qubits. First, let's uh, begin cons uh, talking about what is important. What does a, a good memory uh, 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 look like and what requirements should it satisfy? And we will start with the Di Vincenzo criteria. These criteria were introduced uh, in the context of quantum computation, but we will see that a lot of them apply also in uh, the context of quantum networking. So first, if you want to build a good quantum computer, you need a well-defined qubit. Now, qubits uh, uh, don't come for free in nature. Usually, we have very complicated systems with many different energy levels. And in order to have a good, well-defined qubit, you must be able to take a system for which you can only address uh, two levels and distinguish them and control them in a very uh, good way. Then you need to be able to initialize this qubit. Initialization is important because then you know uh, exactly from what state your uh, quantum computation can start. So if you have a good procedure for initializing your qubit, that allows you to also carry out good quantum computation. Also, you want long lifetimes, meaning that your qubits, when you put them in a superposition of states, they don't decohere very quickly. Long lifetimes allow you to carry out longer and longer quantum computations, which is of course needed if you want to solve harder and harder problems. Also, you must be able to implement a universal set of gates, um, meaning that uh, what your qubit and your physical system need to do is uh, be able to uh, implement a finite set of gates which, when put together in some order, can allow you to simulate a much uh, more complicated evolution. And uh, you need efficient measurements. Uh, just carrying out and transforming the state in a quantum manner is not enough. You somehow have to extract the information uh, at the end of the quantum computation. And in the context of quantum communication, there's a few more requirements that we have to consider. We already saw that uh, it's, uh, we have to somehow convert or entangle stationary and flying qubits. Stationary qubits are those qubits that are sitting in our uh, uh, quantum uh, network nodes. They're loaded into the quantum memories. They don't really move, which is why we call them stationary. Uh, flying qubits are those qubits that are used for uh, entanglement swapping in the BSAs to uh, create link level entanglement. Uh, between, between the quantum memories. And we must be able to entangle photons, i.e. the flying qubits, with the stationary qubits inside the memories, but also we must be able to use entanglement swapping to create end-to-end -end entanglement, so perform entanglement swapping on stationary memories themselves. And then uh, we also must be able to uh, transport flying qubits over long distances. So here we will, uh, in this lesson, sorry, in this step, we will uh, look at these three requirements. So why is memory lifetime important? Well, we said that in computers, uh, if our memory lifetime is long and also our uh, gate speeds are fast, we, we are able to implement, implement uh, uh, longer computations. We can implement more steps of a computation. Uh, in the context of quantum com communication, what's really important is not the gate speed itself, but the number of gates that we can apply per round trip time or per RRT. Uh, cons let's consider how we um, establish link level entanglement. We start with quantum memories and they uh, emit photons. These photons are entangled with the memories and they travel, let's say, to a BSA analyzer, which is found halfway between uh, the quantum nodes. There we perform a Bell state measurement. But then we also have to uh, communicate classically back to the nodes about the outcome of the Bell state measurements. And this is our round trip time. So if our, if, uh, our lifetime of the memory is shorter than that, then we cannot really do much because even if we can perform the Bell state measurements on those uh, photon pairs, uh, by the time uh, this happens, our memories uh, decohere and are not useful anymore. So just to give you some idea of the numbers that uh, we're, we're talking about, uh, the speed of light uh, in a fiber is approximately 200 millimeters per nanosecond. So if our nodes are separated uh, one kilometer away, one round trip from one node to the other and back, 
uh, takes uh, 10 microseconds. For 100 kilometers, it increases to one millisecond. And for 10,000 kilometers, it goes all the way up to uh, 100 milliseconds per round trip time. Now, what are the processes that are degrading our memories? The two main processes are energy relaxation and dephasing. And they are characterized by two different uh, time scales. They are referred to as T1 time scale and T2 time scale. T1 um, characterizes the energy relaxation time, whereas T2 gives us the characteristic dephasing time. So first, let's consider the energy relaxation time given by the time T1. Uh, this basically tells us how likely or how quickly does our qubit decay from the excited state or from state one into a state zero. Um, and uh, the probability that we, uh, if we initialize our state in the state one, the probability that after some time small t, we still find it uh, in the state one is given by this expression. It's e to the power of negative t over capital T1. So the energy relaxation time. So the probability that after t1 seconds uh, we find our state in uh, uh, in the in the state one is given by one over e. And this process of going from one to zero captures the fact that usually zero is um, encoded into a, um, a state of an of an atom, for example, that has a higher energy. That's why we call it the energy relaxation time. Now for the dephasing time, this gives us a time scale where um, we, we lose uh, phase coherence in our qubit. Remember, if we are only using zeros and ones, so basically we are using qubits but implementing only classical uh, communication, T1 is important but T2 not so much because there's no coherence there. We are not using superpositions. But in quantum networking and quantum communication, um, superpositions uh, are, are crucial. And those superpositions can be destroyed by this dephasing, dephasing process. So if we start in, a, in an equal superposition of 0 and 1, so we are starting in the plus state, the T1 is the characteristic time scale that tells us uh, uh, when we will end in a completely mixed state. So completely mixed state is given over here. It's the sum, it's a mixture of these outer products of 0, 0 and 1, 1 divided by 2. And we saw uh, at, in one of the earlier lessons the crucial difference between uh, complete mixtures and uh, um, uh, equal superpositions. So here, after some time t, if we prepare the state in the pure state psi, after some time t, we will have the following mixed state, where with probability p, we will still be in the ideal uh, initial state, and with probability 1 minus p, we will have decohered uh, de into a completely mixed state. And this probability is now given by the following expression of e to the negative uh, t over capital T2. Now both of these processes, the relaxation uh, process and the um, dephasing process, are Poisson process, processes. That's a little bit ironic since we're talking about memories, but these processes are memoryless decay processes. So. We talked about the lifetimes of memories and why they are important, and we gave you some characteristic uh, timescales, uh, which are very important when you are talking about communication over longer distances. Now, let's address the question of how do we actually uh, entangle atoms and photons. So, how, where is our qubit, 0 and 1, where, in our quantum memory? So our quantum memory is a mm, two-level system, for now, uh, and it has a ground state G and some excited state of higher energy, which we can label E. So these are natural candidates for representing 0 and 1. For example, here, uh, this is our two-level atom. This is the state G. This is the excited state E. Uh, and in this particular case, we prepare the, uh, uh, the memory in the excited state. Therefore, it is in the state 1. Now, how do we represent? Uh, how do we represent the flying qubits? Where are the flying qubits? Well, there's different ways of encoding the information into flying qubits. And one possibility is that uh, if we send a photon down a, fi a fiber, so there is a photon, 
we can say that this is R1. So if we detect a photon, we know that we sent a 1. However, we can, if we don't send a photon, so there's nothing, that can encode R0. And here we can see that if the atom uh, decays from the excited state into its ground state, or if it makes a transition from 1 to 0, represented over here, that can emit a photon. Now, how about uh, coherences? How about um, uh, superpositions? Well, we can prepare our memory in a superposition of the ground state and the excited state, so it's an equal superposition of uh, 0 and 1 by ap applying an appropriately timed uh, energy pulse. And our question is, well, what happens to the photon? Does it get emitted? Does it not get emitted? And if it does get, emit, uh, the, if it does get emitted, in what state will it be? Well, here we see that the atom has an equal probability to be found in the ground state. So if it's in the ground state, then it cannot emit any, any energy. So our photon will be in the zero state. There is no photon. Or it has a 50% uh, probability uh, to be in the excited state from where it can emit, and when it does emit, uh, then we will have a photon over here. So in this way, we can think about the photon of being in a superposition of zero and one. There is a photon, and there is not a photon. So we are transferring the state plus from the atomic memory to the flying qubit. This is a very naive, uh, naive picture that demonstrates only some of the basic uh, uh, principles of how stationary and flying qubits uh, interact together. In real systems, things are a lot more complicated. In particular, when we look at this encoding of just having two levels for our quantum memory, then this is usable, but uh, it's not a very good qubit. Because due to the uh, uh, energy relaxation process, our uh, excited state will eventually decay into a zero. So it will destroy whatever message, whatever state we have encoded into the quantum memory. Similarly, this encoding for the flying qubits of having a no photon and a photon representing our zero and one is not very good due to the attenuation of uh, light in fibers. We described it in some detail that as we send photons down fibers, they're very likely to be lost and attenuated. So, at, uh, if we are waiting for some message at the end of the fiber and we don't receive a photon, we cannot be sure, was the original message really zero? So. Uh, is it correct that we are finding no photon? Or was the initial message one and the photon just got lost along the way? So we have to be a little bit more careful and think how to uh, encode our information in a better, more robust way. Consider the following, following uh, atomic structure. We've got two degenerate ground states and we will label them as ground state up and ground state down. And these can represent the two spins of, of uh, our atom. For our flying qubits, we can consider polarization. So zero will be represented by vertical polarization, and one will be represented by horizontal polarization. We can prepare uh, our atom initially in the excited state. And then what can happen is that the atom can decay either to uh, the ground state with spin up or to the ground state with spin down. The thing is, we can only see that there's a photon coming out and we don't actually know into which ground state uh, the atom decayed. So we are effectively implementing the following, following transformation. We go from the excited state of the atom to a superposition of the atom being found in the spin up state if that's true, then the photon that gets emitted just happens to have a vertical polarization. On the other hand, if it decays into the other uh, a ground state given by spin down, then the photon will have a horizontal a polarization. So really what we are doing is we are obtaining the following superposition of two qubits. We have an equal superposition of the atom being in the spin up state and the emitted photon being in the uh, vertically polarized and uh, the other term which is uh, the atom being found in the spin down state and the photon being horizontally polarized. So 
In this way, we are entangling the flying photon with the stationary qubit of the memory. And to bring this all back, this is another representation of our Bell state analyzer, which we have before drawn very abstractly, but now you have a much better idea how it actually works in practice. So here uh, we have two single mode fibers. And at the end, we've got quantum memories. Each memory is prepared in, uh, initially in the excited state. It decays into one of its um, uh, ground states, either spin up or spin down. We don't know which one. Therefore, the uh, flying photon is entangled with its respective memory. These flying photons now travel through the single mode fibers. They hit the beam splitter, they interfere, and we perform a Bell state measurement. And in this way, we can establish uh, link level entanglement between the uh, um, atomic memories sitting uh, at the end of uh, uh, the ends of the uh, link. So, and this is exactly the scheme that we have described previously with uh, memory interference memory, MIM, or it can also be used in the following scenario where we have direct memory to memory connection.